Welcome to Basketball in Figueroa, the only podcast breaking down everything happening with the Lakers, Clippers, and Sparks. I'm your host, Edward Garcia, and joining me today, per usual, is Dar E. N. Viziri, a.k.a. Dime Dropper. Dime. The Clippers will never play again at Crypto.com Arena as a home team. How's that sit with you? It's 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 uh it's time to go. I'm excited to move into a new building and hear the sound of a new building. But I didn't feel as emotional as I thought it would be just because the series wasn't over at the time that it was the last game, even though I felt like it probably was o- it was probably over. I was just so done with this year's team that I wasn't even taking it all in in that way about the whole last day at Staples Center thing, last game. I think the regular season game, the final regular season game, felt like more of a emotional day. But, yeah, it's crazy to think about, Edwin. So many amazing memories. I haven't really done, like, a proper, like, goodbye or, or like, emotional post kind of thing. And who knows? Maybe I will after the season's over. But, yeah, man, it's crazy. Uh, it really is crazy. And so it looks like I'm just going to have to go to more Kings games. <laughs> well, that's another team that plays basketball there. I'm not sure if you heard of them. They're the Lakers. So, you know. Well, I just the tickets are just not affordable. Like, I, I, you know what I mean? That's kind of why. Of course, I'm a Kings fan. And I would like to. If Listen, if Laker games were as affordable as Kings games, I'd be there a good amount. Because I love basketball. But it's just so expensive. You know, Kings, my team, less expensive. That's more of what it is, you know. I, I know our guy Golden Knight's listening, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna say shout out to Golden Knight. I think he can hook you up with some tickets. He, he's got a lot of clout recently. I've noticed he, he's getting up there with the big wigs. I think he can spare you a, a 200 level seat. I think at least. So we'll see if we can get you get you a couple spots there <laughs> when they come back. But I get you right. Like you already got a lot of stuff to do. Like it's busy, and again, like you said, the money gets so high. Before I was doing this as um, more on the fan side versus now I'm like you know it's my job. I had a goal of like going once a month. To, to Laker games just so I could at least have a little bit of a pulse of what was going on. And just like you, I had to figure out, okay, the, the money and where am I going to sit? And like, I don't want to be up in the nosebleeds, but it's so pricey. And I'm, I'm trying to pick the games that I think people aren't going to want to go to as much so I can get tickets. You know, when's OKC coming to town? You know, wh- when are we playing the Pelicans or someone that like, I know the price will like the Pelicans on a Thursday night, I might get it for like, you know, 80 something instead of like 250 and stuff like that. So I, I get it. It's definitely an issue with, the Lakers, they can't really solve that unless they had a huge stadium because it's just the demand, right? They're always going to be a hot ticket uh, as long as they have some kind of relevancy. And it looks like as long as LeBron's there, it's going to be an expensive ticket. So so I feel you on that. But, yeah, I, I thought the same thing when, you know, as you know, I, I know a lot of Clipper fans now, you know, doing the pod and just being more on Twitter and just, like, also being like, hey, you know, like, we're talking about the Clippers. Like, it's cool. Let's talk about it. And I feel like everyone else kind of felt the same thing. I don't know anyone who's a Clippers fan who like by the time we got to game five or so was like, come on, they can still do it. It felt like a lot of y'all just wanted it done. Like you were exhausted about is Kawhi going to play? Is he not going to play? We're playing Luca again, Tyler rumors. It felt like the, the fan base, obviously y'all were cheering for the win, but you're like, you know what? Either way, if we lose, at least we're done with this and we can just kind of start fresh. So it felt like that was kind of the general consensus. It was, we want to win. But it ain't the worst thing if we can just turn the page <laughs> on this season and move on. So, and yeah, like you said, losing game five was rough, but you figured, at least I did. I'm like, well, I wouldn't be shocked if they win game six, game seven. I don't know. So, yeah, it was kind of the suddenness. Same thing happened with us, right? We won game four, and although winning game five was going to be a long shot, you're still like, well, we could come back for a game six. And then, of course, you know, there was no return. Uh, I guess th- this year the theme for both teams was like not knowing when the end was, but the end was before <laughs> earlier than we thought it would be. Um, so, obviously, we talked about the Lakers elimination in, in the last pod. So, let's focus here on, on the Clippers one. Let, let's focus more on, on the, the final game, game six, because game five obviously was disappointment and, and, and all that. But game six was the, the final one there. Um, wh- what happened? Why why did the, the Mavericks kind of, like, maintain control and ultimately win this series? What was the biggest difference here in these, like, last two games, especially that, that game six, in your opinion, that kind of, like, put the nail in the coffin of the Clippers season? I think the quality ended up showing itself in the end. Like the Dallas Mavericks are just, without Kawhi, a better team. 
They have the better duo, you know, Luca and Kyrie over Harden and Paul. And Luca just started kind of reverting back to the the shot making Luca that we all know in games five and six. So that was one thing. Paul George and James Harden, particularly Paul George, was just horrific. Locked up by Derek Jones Jr. Uh, in game six, he had Kyrie Irving on him at times and settled for 20 footers. Like just it. Yeah, it basically all kind of unraveled. And, you know, it's tough when you put yourself in a position to win a game like that on the road, do or like a closeout game on the road. It's just when, when the other team makes big plays, that crowd is going to push, and it's just really hard to build momentum. You're going to have to make some really big shots to quiet crowds, and we just didn't have enough shot making. And cre the creation wasn't great because – you know, Kawhi Leonard. It just finally showed that we, you know, the Clippers mm -hmm. and Kawhi Leonard are not better than the Mavericks. We're never going to beat them. But Paul George to play that way. James Harden didn't shoot well, but at least I thought he was being aggressive. Game five was the classic Harden stinker. <laughs> Paul George, though, I mean, if I'm going to criticize James Harden the way I do, Paul George might have to fit into the sim similar fit into a similar category at this point. I mean. You know, three postseasons with the Clippers, the bubble, everybody remembers it was a disaster. He got his redemption when he got us to the conference finals and made history for the franchise. And then third time, you know, the, 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 the tiebreaker, and he totally fell flat. So, yeah, there's not nothing more to say except for that basically everybody outside of, like, maybe Man and Zoo, and then you can make an argument for Harden. If you hold him to a star standard, it's not that great, but – if you hold him to expecting some bad performances in the playoffs, he was pretty decent, pretty good. And, yeah, that's about all I can say. Congrats to the Mavericks for finally beating us. But no Kawhi, I'm sorry. Like, I don't think it's that impressive. Good for them. They be But, see, I'm not saying that us beating them in the past was impressive either because we were the better team. Yeah. So it's never really been a fair fight. We wanted this to be the fair fight. We didn't really get it because Kawhi was out. And I'm surprised we even got it to six. But – Congrats to them, and I'm looking forward to their series against the Thunder. Every single L.A. team out in the first round, Kings, Clippers, and the Lakers, sad. Well, Cali team, yeah. Forget those guys, though. Who cares? You know, this is basketball in Figueroa, not basketball in California. Hey, okay. Yeah, it's like that. My parents do this nonsense where they're, like, rooting for the Warriors. They're like, oh, it's a California team, Steve Kerr's from L.A., and all this stuff, Clay Thompson. Everybody's from LA. from L.A. You know, Santa Barbara, by the way, not necessarily L.A., but okay. Steve Kerr's not from Santa Barbara. He's not from Santa Barbara. Oh, he went to school. Where'd he go? Santa Cruz? No, he, went to, he, went to, he went to my high school, Palisades. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, by Santa Monica. Yeah, it's just his beach. You, I, you know, it's just, I think he probably got it confused because he's by water. But, yeah, the Santa, right? Yeah. I'm like, I saw his house. I'm like, whatever. He's far from me. <laughs> yeah, because his dad was a professor at UCLA, so that would be a pretty long commute if you were coming from Santa Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's true. Rest in peace, Mr. Uh, Professor Kerr. But anyway. Yeah, th that, that story on Last Dance was so powerful. I was like, I didn't know all that, you know? Like, so for me, that was new new news. So, yeah, that was definitely a powerful story. Yeah, shout out, shout out, Kerr. Steve yeah. Kerr. Steve Kerr is like our most famous basketball alumni. He's only one of two players ever to make the NBA from Valley High. But the other one's, uh, what's his name? Kiki Vandaway, who's definitely better than Steve Kerr. Do you guys got like a mural of him or is there any like? Not, bro, nothing. There's nothing. Nothing? That's yeah, our school, our school is decent in uh in sports, but not in certain sports. But it's mostly known for like movies and stuff. You know what I mean? And like okay, TV shows being filmed there. But anyway, um, my parents do that stuff with like the Steve Kerr from LA, Clay. It's a California team. I'm like, dude, they hate our guts. Like the Northern California people hate our guts. Like it's not one big happy state. No, it's not we, because you know, they're jealous of our our wonderful weather and lack of you know. Uh, other things that are negative about uh, that. Yeah, we definitely don't like it. It's <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. They got you know up there North NorCal. They got like mediocre Mexican food, and they got like you know it's always all dusty and windy, and their hills are higher, and their rents are higher, and their people look uglier. You know, like all that kind of stuff. You know? I agree with that. I agree. I mean, I'm not denying that. People look better because they don't. They don't. No. They don't. 
Well, it's, I'm, I'm not. I mean, who knows? Person. Maybe our, our future wives are in Northern California. In that case, I apologize, but they were probably the exception to the rule. <laughs> exactly. I was going to say that the diamond <laughs> in the rough. <laughs> yeah, diamond. See, and need... it'd be rough up there. <laughs> <laughs> See, we need shows like this where we're just like ignorant Los Angeles people because they don't have enough of these Boston and New Yorkers and Philadelphia fans get to do it. We don't get to do it. I'm serious. I mean, you know, I'm just saying, you, you know, you, you go to a bar and in. You know, in San Francisco, you're probably leaving by yourself, and it's probably by choice. You know what I mean? <laughs> anyway. But you, will, hey, you did mention mediocre Mexican food, but I will say they have some great Asian food. Yes, their Asian food's good. I agree. I agree. The Asian food in, in the Bay, I have no beef with. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've i eaten it. Like All the spots, yeah, they, they're they mediocre. The burritos, all that stuff, mid, 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 mid. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know San Francisco was going to catch a stray like that today. That we should gorgeous. save it for the All Star, which is next year. We could be like, oh, you know, we should do like a a, a hate like stop at the restaurant and be like, man, this is just you know, it's, it's half, the, half the quality, twice the price. It doesn't make any sense. You know? Yeah, road trip, man, just trash. Everybody. Oh yeah, definitely. We could definitely do a road trip. Yeah, that'll be that'll be. Wait, where was our original topic here? <laughs> Oh, that the, all the LA teams are out. Yeah, I concluded all my the teams are out. I mentioned all the California teams, and you were like, I don't even want to talk about that part. Yeah, yeah. That's that's how we ended up on not not wanting to talk about the Warriors. And somehow, you know, we, we got into it. But yeah, you're right. Let's go, let's go back to it. So yeah, all postseason action in crypto is done. And for the Clippers, it's done forever. And for the Lakers, obviously, it's a maybe next year. Same with the Kings here. So yeah, it's 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 a it's a, it's a shocker, right? We would I think I expected the Clippers to maybe go farther, but once I saw their matchup, I was like, okay, now it's 50, 50, you know, even though they lost in six, you know, again, like you mentioned, it's the, it's not excuses, just giving context without Kawhi. I mean, even if you won this series, they're, they're no longer a long shot to win the title. It's just like not good enough. They're probably not even good enough with Kawhi without him. Again, same thing with the Lakers, right? You take LeBron or AD out. That's it. Like it doesn't matter. It, Reeves is not going to make up for what LeBron does. Like it's over. That that's just kind of how that works. So it, it kind of ended up the same kind of setup for the Clippers. Unfortunately, I think they do have problems bigger than just that. So you can't just say, "Oh, well, if Kawhi would come back, you know, problem solved." No, no, no. I think the problems are are pretty big in in the Clippers land. Not in terms of like a toxic community or like a, a mass necessarily. It's just like, well, you haven't reached the levels that you wanted to. That title contention with this squad. What to do now? I know on on your um your YouTube channel, Dying, which which obviously was is airing video wise. You know, you went on a really long rant. I think a really good rant about the negatives there with the Clippers and kind of the issues. And you're definitely on Team Blow It Up. I know a lot of people now seem to be on Team Blow It Up. But Lawrence Frank, I didn't hear all of the comments he made today, uh, representing the Clippers and talking about the 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 vision for the Clippers. But he kind of seemed to to imply they're going to try to essentially run it back. Now, we've also seen reports, again, it's early reports, this diet's like, oh my god, early reports, but we also heard reports that PG is going to try free agency, so who knows, maybe you can't run it back necessarily. Um, now, I know you want to blow it up, but those are not going to blow it up, they'll probably do a little moving in here and there. So how are you feeling, let's, let's start here with PG. Do you want to give him close to the max? Do you want him to walk? Are you okay with him walking for nothing and you don't even get assets? Do you want to sign in trades? Do you get some of those draft picks back that you mentioned? Um, how are you feeling about the PG situation first? And then we can maybe go past that. Someone wrote that it's not possible for us to do a sign in trade, I don't think. Mm. So I don't think that's on the table. Okay. So but, do you, do you want to do you just want to try to get him for the as close to the max but not the max? Do you just want them to him to walk away then and just just be done with it? What, what are you thinking? At this point, I don't care because I think we're screwed either way. I think if you re-sign him, it's not going to be a deal that is going to be like, oh, what a great deal the Clippers signed him for. Like it's not going to be. I don't think, and. Mm -hmm. I truly think Philadelphia should go for it. I, I really think they should. I think a Maxi and Bead Paul George trio is it's got a shot. That's the ideal role for Paul George at this point, is a third option. His motor's so inconsistent. You just don't know what you're gonna get. You know what I mean? So yeah. And he brings experience. You know, he does bring experience more than they have in the playoffs. So I, I don't really know. I I think if we do re-sign him, we should definitely look to trade him in the in the season or something. Like, 
Mm. But at the same, but here's, here's the thing though. At the same time, if you want to keep Kawhi and you're like really run it back, then like, yeah, re resign him. What are you waiting for? Like, just go yeah. all in. But it's just, you don't want him for as much as you signed Kawhi to, which was 50 million a year. He definitely deserves <clears throat> a little Kawhi. I think that's the whole yeah. point. That's the whole holdup. Yeah. So at this point, Edwin, I just think we're kind of screwed because let's say he does walk. I'm not tripping that he's gone, but we're not getting, we don't have that much cap. You know what I mean? At all. It's like we might be able to sign someone for like the, taxpayer mid-level exception whatever it is but that's not moving the needle like to me it's 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 if you're keeping Kawhi, what happens with paul doesn't matter that that's honestly how i feel which mm. looks like they are okay as you said. yeah it looks like they are it, yeah i think pg i don't know if his ego's hurt that he didn't get the money right away or or what the holdup is maybe he wants to see the market hey can i get that somewhere else um like I said, it sounds like you're kind of okay with, hey, if they end here, they end here. Um, right. So, yeah, it, it'll be interesting. I think I think they're probably going to essentially run it back for the most part. And then I think the next season is probably going to be the one where you really say, okay, let's blow it up. Um, that, that's that's the feeling I get. But it's interesting. We'll, we'll see what they actually do. And we'll have plenty of time to kind of break that down as they, you know, kind of go, if we go into offseason now, essentially – which, uh, you know, you'll start to see a couple small moves, management, coaching, that kind of thing. Ty Lue, is he going to get an extension now? Because the minute the Lakers came by, Ty Lue, they're like, oh, we want to keep him forever, actually. So we'll see what happens there. So actually, that's a good segue for us to go into the, the Lakers news we do have, which is Darvin Ham was officially let go this past Friday. I'm not sure, Tommy, if I, I told you, but Fred pretty much, I mean, it was not news. Everyone kind of knew what was happening, and, and I was told it was, it was probably going to be Friday. Uh, which is the exact day that it was. You know, it kind of made sense. The Friday news dump, they wanted to make it seem like they were deliberating or whatever. They didn't want it to be kind of instant the way it was with Frank Vogel, where it was like the second the game was done. So I think this was a little bit of an overcorrection where they were like, well, we'll give it a few days so it doesn't look so bad, you know, and stuff like that. But ultimately, they they officially let Darvin Ham go. They are now not without – there was no coaching at this point. They also let go of all supporting staff. So Phil Handy's not associated with the Lakers at this point. No one is. They said, we're going to start completely clean. Whoever comes in is going to have the reins, right? So, um, Dime, I know you, you, you've you mentioned before, you know, Ham's follies, but also said, hey, it's not all him, which I agree with. Uh, what are your, some of your thoughts here on, on Ham being out and, and what this means for the Lakers and, and kind of where they should go uh, moving forward? Well, we knew it was coming, as you said. It's the right move. It's the right move. But, yeah, I mean, let's see who the Lakers go with. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that they should look into potentially hiring a rookie coach again, or should it be a rookie coaches are out? I think in, I think rookie coaches should probably be out. I think rookie coaches are not out, <laughs> as uh, some of the early reports are. But I think the Lakers have struggled filling that role. It, it, it seems like it's always so volatile. And that was always true, but I think there needs to be someone that has respect beyond just initial respect and, and giving it a chance. I think it's got to be a coach they commit to, and they commit to legitimately. And what I mean by that, because they gave Darvin Ham a four-year contract. He only finished half of it, right? I think it has to be a coach of prestige that they're going to say, no matter what, we're not going to budge on this guy for a couple of years, two, three, four years, whatever that contract is going to be. It has to be that. So I think it's going to be tricky for them to find because there aren't that many coaches with that kind of legacy and respect that also aren't with baggage of like losing or being out of the league for several years. So I think it's tough right now. I don't see, even if I had a magic wand and they're like, Edwin, we're going to give you, you have full authority. What you say goes. I don't know who I don't know who I picked that I really feel great about. I have some that I feel better about than others, but I don't really have one that I really feel great about. I do have concern with the rookie coach thing. I just think this is a tough job. This is maybe the last go with LeBron. And I'm just concerned they'll mess this up too. And then we end with like, see, we gave the wrong coach the final chance with LeBron. And now it's really over. Because as you know, it, it's coming. We might not think it is, and the numbers might show us that it's not. Eventually, he's, I think he's just going to have to walk away before fading away because he's fading away so slowly. <laughs> it looks like he can go another eight years, you know, and average like double digits or something like that, you know. So I think he'll probably leave with a little bit of juice left, two, three years or so. And it seems like his agents kind of mentioned that he's got like two or three left in him. 
So if, if that's true, this is the last chance, you know, if you can get a star and, and get a coach and try to try to win him one at the end, you know, a la like Duncan kind of, you know, uh, you got to get this coaching position right. So, yeah, generally for me, I would generally be out uh, rookie coaches. I'll be very cautious if they do sign a rookie coach about how excited I'll be until I see it on the court. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I don't think a rookie coach is the move again. How about uh, Mike Budenholzer? I like it in theory. I shudder to think what that's going to be like because he is a coach that is very stuck in his ways. That's where Darvin Ham comes from. And what's the one thing, as you know, I um, uh, Dime, you know, the you're you're the rent rotations players when when they play, you know, take them out. Why do you play this guy? What's yeah. the number one thing we heard when Mike Budenholzer was with the Bucks? Giannis, play Giannis more. Play Giannis more. You got to play Giannis more. You got to play Giannis more. Mm-hmm. I don't want to hear Laker fans every day complaining about AD only played 28 minutes. LeBron only played 27 minutes. We were up by four and he took him out and we lost by six on a February. Mm-hmm. Like that's going to happen so much with that coach because he seems extremely rigid on his plan. Now, if you remember the Phil Jackson years, he was also rigid like that, but he had the power that as much as people were mad when Lamar Odom was on a heater and he pulled them because that's when he pulled them. He had the sway of his rings and everything to kind of say, hey, shut up. I know what I'm doing. Too right. bad. Trevor Reese is getting pulled because he gets pulled at the sixth minute of the third quarter every game. So too bad, right? So that's my concern. I like Budenholzer, though. I, I think that'd be cool. But I, I'm just worried if people didn't have the patience with hand, I don't know what they do with Budenholzer. Unless he just kills it so much early on that he buys himself a little time. But I, I feel like that's the conversations are going to be exhausting if he takes that job. Yeah. I'm trying to think of some other names. Uh, but well, we had a few we talked about on uh, Basketball Figaro. Terry Stotts was one. Uh, Atkins is another. Atkinson? Um, yeah, yeah. And we had, um, obviously, what J.J. Think- Redick, rookie coach. So, what, what do you think about Atkinson? I, I think he, I think he'd be good. I, I, I think Stotts would probably be, the, if I had to pick right now, Stotts is like the oldest one that I'm like, like a veteran. I'm like, I feel like that could be okay. Um like I said, I'm not really like crazy about every single like there's not one that I'm like, that's the guy. Like, I want that guy. Like, I just don't feel like there is one this time around. Who knows who becomes available or, you know, if someone, you know, just decides that they need a change and 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 or gets surprisingly let go every year. There's no reaction to the playoffs. So, you know, we'll see what happens. Maybe Mike Malone's on his way out after getting swept because apparently getting swept is the worst thing a team can do. Uh, that's what I've been told. So, uh, you know, if you get swept by uh, rookie team called the Timberwolves then you know maybe Mike Malone needs a new job and you know we can scoop him up he could he could be he thinks he's a Lakers daddy he could show us how it's done you know <laughs> what a world that would be Mike Malone as <laughs> a Lakers coach um so yeah that, that that's where I'm at with that um those are my thoughts on some early um ideas for head coach the Reddick thing scares me I think you know, we got to be careful there. I, I know that would, I wonder how, how, let me ask you, how would you feel about JJ Redick uh, going from coaching his little son's team to the Lakers? Like, because he has a podcast with LeBron James. <laughs> Just gives me even more reason to hate on the Lakers. <laughs> yeah, I don't want that. Um, I mean, JJ does the game. He's a smart guy. But again, I think the funny thing about that, I mean, they're, they're finding their lane with that, but I'm like, yeah, if you talk to most NBA players, like, guess what? They know how the sport they play works. Like, he's not necessarily a genius. He's just, I mean, you know, like, I would hope you know your playbook. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think I think part of it is he's good at articulating himself. And he can break I mean? it down. In a, there's people, and I was talking to this with a friend. Um, there's people who know the game, like you, Dime, right? And you do a pretty good job of it. But some people, they're so nerdy with it that they talk in a way that the average person's like, I don't know what you're saying. You know, like, I don't know. You're, 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 you're talking in too many basketball terms. And I think, you know, like you said, he's he's personable and he finds a way to discuss it without it being condescending or too confusing where you're like, I don't know what this means. For the most part, if you see the visuals and stuff, he kind of breaks it down where he's like, oh, I'm just trying to get an open three. And this guy frees up this guy, frees up that guy. There's my open shot. And you're like, oh, wow. And it's like, I mean, again, he, he's doing a good job. But it's like, bro, like, don't give him this job because he does a podcast. Well, please, it's not the job. The job is dealing with these issues, dealing with these dynamics. Can he actually argue with LeBron? Will he stand up in a room and, and you know, be demonstrative and be controversial or, or 
hold him accountable. Like those are things that I don't know from the podcast, you know? So <laughs> uh, we'll see. Uh, I, this is a question I've been asked a lot. How much time do you feel like Polinka needs to get some blame? Because he was a part of all these coaching hires recently and they all have had mixed, a mixed bag of reaction. Or is he just kind of getting the, is LeBron kind of saving him because people think he's the lead GM. So they're like, well, it's not Polinka's fault. Is he kind of getting away with, these hires and not getting any blame on, on what's going on. No, I don't think so. I think Vogel, I mean, you can, if you want to go back to the old Ty Lue thing, then yeah. Like he didn't let him pick his own staff. He wanted to, th- what is it? He wanted a three-year deal and they only gave him two years. Yeah. Right? It was a three-year deal, two-year deal. And they wanted, um, I think they wanted Jason Kidd on his staff or something like that. And he was right. like, no, I'm picking my own staff. So there was an issue with the years and there was an issue with the, some of the staffing. Okay. So, yeah, that was a blunder, right? I'll, you can hold him accountable for that. But let's be honest. Like, how much love do you have for that 2020 team? Because Vogel did a good job with them. Yeah, they were great. You know, I was talking about it yesterday. Or not yesterday. A couple of days ago. Listen to this Lakers 2020 team. LeBron, Avery Bradley, KCP. Just I'm not trying to talk about how stacked it is. But listen, to this, there's a certain theme about these players. LeBron in that season. AD, KCP, Avery Bradley. Caruso, Kyle Kuzma, Dwight Howard, JaVale McGee. It's all, and Danny Green. It's all a bunch of guys that can guard through all, all across the board. I mean, it's just, you know, you see why the defense was so good. So Vogel did a good job there. The following year, I don't think Vogel did anything wrong. I think Lakers looked like one of the best teams in the league, but AD had that inconsistent motor coming off the ring. One night he played great, the next night he wouldn't. And then LeBron got injured which really derailed the season. Yeah. And and I don't really think that you guys losing in the playoffs was Vogel's fault. I no. think I think Palinka did make a mistake, though, by getting Andre Drummond. That was just weird. And taking away Marc Gasol's role when Mark was still a pretty good player in that season. I just think that people were upset that, oh, we don't have the rim protection of a Dwight Howard and JaVale McGee, and they saw Marc Gasol was more like a below-the-rim kind of center. But he offered different things to the Lakers that they didn't have with Dwight and JaVale. I think I think that's forever going to be one of the Lakers that just wasn't appreciated enough in the short time that he got, and getting Drummond really took away from what could have maybe given you a better chance without AD that year. Mm-hmm. But I don't blame Belinka for the Westbrook thing. I think that was majorly player pushed and reeks of it. Um, and then Darvin Ham, you know, I think he was on the coaching staff in Milwaukee. These the young black coach is, is very in now. You know what I mean? That's what teams are trying. Ty Lu, Jamal Mosley, Ime Udoka, Joe Mazzula, like across the league. And I and at the end of the day, it's like there's no coach that's getting hired without LeBron and AD saying yes. That's a big thing. Head coach. Like mm-hmm. I'm not saying LeBron's gotten everything he wanted in that department because of course he wanted Ty Lu. But it's not like they're hiring Darvin Hammond, LeBron, and AD's like, no, I don't trust this guy, rookie coach. Like, I don't think that happened right away. And let's be honest, the first no. year that you guys had him, the complaints weren't that Good loud. Job. Right. No, you did a good job. So it, no, it I, don't was blame, I, don't I don't blame Palinka for that. Yeah, I think Palinka definitely deserves – I think he deserves a little more blame than he gets just because the overcorrection of 2020. And I won't go into all the details, but I will say it was a combination. Did LeBron want Russell Westbrook? I believe so. Was management a little split? I believe so. Was Polinka sure himself? I don't believe so. I think he was 50-50 on it, and he's like, well, Russ works. I think Russ could work. LeBron thinks it works. I think I'm going to go with it. From from what I know, that's kind of how it went. So, so yeah, does that's LeBron what I get some of the, Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Does Bron get, Bron get some of the blame? Yeah, sure. But I think Polinka does, too, because I, I, I can – not reporting this, but I, I feel very comfortable saying Polinka was not like, oh, no, Russ is a bad decision. I don't like the Russ. I think he was feeling it, too. Maybe not as much as Braun was, but he was like he he was into the idea, just just a little concerned of the same concerns we have about the fit not working. But it wasn't like Polinka was you know shouting from the rooftops, "This is a bad deal. I don't want to do this, but I'll do it." Because the like it wasn't that. So I'll give him like if you were to per, put percentages on it, you give you give LeBron sixty percent blame, and you give Polinka the organization forty because they weren't exactly against it either. They thought it could work. We have concerns, but it could work. So it was a, a a group effort in the in that. So I'll give him a little bit of that, but not all of it. I think the I think he's done a great job with trades for the most part. I think he did a great job 
uh, building most of this team. But again, the bigs have been an issue, which I think you hit the nail on the head on. I think it was the Drummond thing, Gasol's position not being, you know, what it should have been. And this year, where was AD's help? He had no help defensively. He didn't have a, a dominant center starting with him. He didn't have dominant centers. Like, you cannot have the backups be, you know, a Jackson Hayes who's still kind of shaky and, and hasn't really proven himself. That's why his team didn't pick up his, his rookie contract, right? And then um, just having older players like Christian Wood who also, again, these were like, you cannot, that, that position is too important. One, if AD goes down, you need a big. And two, even when he's not down, like, he needs help on the rebounding boards. He needs help rim protection. Like, he did not have anyone there. It was him and whoever was left from those two guys. And as you saw, that wasn't good enough. Like, the one game the Lakers won against the Nuggets, AD had half of the team's rebounds. He had, like, 25 rebounds. Like, that's just – you can't ask him, hey, do that three more times so we can win some games. Like, <laughs> you know, like, he needs guys out there who can crash the boards, who are big enough to do that, who can stand up to these guys. Look what we're seeing. Like you mentioned, we're seeing defense and size wins, right? All the teams left, they have that, right? The th At least in the West. The Thunder, they might be the exception, but they have some incredible guard play, and they're still kind of a big team in general. And the Nuggets obviously have that, and the Wolves obviously have that. You're going to need that if you're going to beat those top teams. You're going to need to be able to, you know, pound, pound the boards, protect your rim, attack the basket, and while AD can do all that, he needs some help. He needs those role players. Um, so I think that's one thing I'm going to be looking at this year with Polinka. He better find a serviceable backup center, and it better not be like a vet minimum guy or a guy who we think might be a diamond in the rough because his old team neglected him. We need someone who's like, oh, no, this is a bona fide stud. And then if you want to take a couple flyers on guys, cool. And again, at the trade deadline, they could have went with the big. They could have went with a buyout big. Instead, they rolled the dice with Spencer Dinwiddie, who kind of was he was okay, but you know it wasn't that great. And that was their that was their buyout market guy, and that's what they chose to do instead of going for trades and doing that. So they kicked the can down the curve, and I think Polink is definitely going to be judged by this summer. He said they chose not to make a trade with D'Lo and Murray because it wasn't going to basically be good enough, or if it was a positive, it was such a small positive, it wasn't worth it and that they'd have an opportunity this summer to make a substantial upgrade in those positions. So I need to see it this summer. So we'll see what he does. Now we're, we're heading into that summer, so it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how that all goes down. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, cool. Are we done there with the with Clippers and uh, Lakers now for at least a little bit here? <laughs> yeah, it seems like it. All right. Uh, of course, we'll, we'll keep on updating. Uh, we'll, we'll see, you know, obviously me and Dime will talk off camera like, are we going to do just general NBA, at least for the beginning, while those two kind of wait out? Or if we get enough significant news throughout, uh, we'll keep going. For Obviously, for the Lakers, it's going to be about the head coaching search. I'm guessing it's going to be about two or three weeks. I don't think it'll take too, too long. One, they have the combine coming up in a couple weeks in Chicago. And two, they have the draft coming up. And you probably want to have a coaching staff <laughs> for those kinds of things. So they need to take care of that. And the Clippers, same thing. Does Tyler get that extension? What do we hear? We'll kind of keep up on the, the news going on with those things. Contracts will probably still be a ways away because, as you know, that's not till like around June 30th when the deadlines are up and stuff and, and they can actually negotiate on those things. But we'll kind of keep track on that and kind of pivot more towards what's going on with the Sparks as they get kicked off and, and maybe some general NBA while the season's still kind of going on. Um, all right, so let's go into a little bit about my experience at the Sparks Media Day, which was last, I think it was either Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, what was it, Monday? I don't know, it was last week. That's what I remember. The days have kind of melted together. But it was last week I headed up there to um, speak with um, all the players and uh, the head coach and other people that are, you know, in, in management, like Reagan Pleebly. So it was a really good experience there and talking with them. And overall, I'm, my biggest takeaway was, and my biggest takeaway for all media days is like, there's kind of a couple of jobs. One, you have to establish with the media and with the fans what the goals and like what this year is looking like. And I think from that, what you mainly got was excitement for the rookies, um, excitement for kind of having a clean slate in a new era with the old guard, like obviously Kenneth Parker's long gone. Nekagumake is gone now. It's like, it's a fresh start. Some young kids, a couple vets. We're, we're like a startup here that that's going towards the goal of being one of those upper echelon teams once again. And a lot of talk of like having grace with the stars. People are excited. They're ready. But you got to give them some time because they're still new. 
uh, that was kind of my general uh, feelings. And I, I talked at least for a couple minutes with pretty much every single player on the roster. So, uh, Don, I'm going to kind of leave it off to you to give me some questions. Uh, oh, another thing, too, is one of my big takeaways, we talked about basketball ideologies like last pod. One was my whole, like, you got to be within 10 points. Start in the fourth quarter if you want to come back. Another one is you can't win media day because a lot of people, they're kind of cynical, right? They're like, oh, who cares? They're just going to talk about how everyone's in the best shape of their life and blah, 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 right? <laughs> oh, he's changed the into it, though. Look at that. Dime tried to sneak a, into a dome picture. In the, I love it. How are you making our way down the 405, brother? Shout out. I didn't know that Dime moves quick, man. I got to talk to your exes about this. This, is, this, was, a, this was a fast turnaround. <laughs> There's only one. He said he, he, lamented, he lamented crypto for two seconds before the into a dome banner went <laughs> Yeah, this is definitely not going to be the one that sticks. We'll have to get one of the court behind it, but um... yeah, yeah, for sure. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I got distracted. There. One of my ideologies about media day, yeah, yes, it's going to be all fluffy, right? Everyone's happy. But what I will say is, you can't you can't win on media day because there's no games, but you can lose by saying the wrong thing, by having a meet. You know, there, there's things you could say that make me think, uh oh, we're in trouble. Like I remember. One of the famous ones uh, a couple years back, Derek Fisher, you know, talked about the acquisition of Liz Cambage, and he's like, this is either going to work extremely well or implode. He said that on the first day, and it did implode. And I was like, why are those the only two options? Either succeed or implode? It was like, bro, that's that's kind of a warning there. And he was right. It did implode. He got fired th- during that season after, like I think, like five or six games. Uh, Cambage left mid-season so it's like it did implode just like he predicted on media day and media day was the warning we got that this can go really bad and it did so we didn't get any so the good news for the sparks is there was no comment like that that made you say what it was all pretty good it was all pretty positive but uh Diane, do you have any questions for me since i was there and you know you probably haven't caught up on like the audio and like you know what was kind of said there about the team in general as we we're kind of just starting preseason and, and kind of what was going down there at media day yeah, I'd say. What does it sound like? The expectations of the of the team uh, is what. What does it sound like? The expectations are of the team, and then how did Cam and Rakia sound? Yeah, the great question. So I think the expectation they're not putting like a playoff or bust or like any kind of thing like that. There, it seems that like they're just generally saying we just want to get better, get better every day, and they don't have a leader. And I don't think that's a bad thing yet. But they talk a lot about the committee. Like, oh, now we have a bunch of players that... Because before it was very clear who the leader was. It's NECA. That's her team. And then, like, who's number two? I don't know. But it's NECA's number one, right? The Lakers almost have that problem, but they don't. You're like, it's LeBron and AD. You can put them however you want. That's the two dogs, right? You mentioned it. Coaching decisions, LeBron and AD are going to be part of that. Period, right? With the Sparks right now, with NECA gone, there isn't a player that's got a long, rich tenure that's like an all-star. So it feels like right now they're all kind of playing nice. Everyone's saying like, oh, we're a team effort. Like we're all trying to like take the mantle of leadership. But I think when you have a bunch of leaders, you have none. So I think within, I think in the first couple of weeks, we're going to find out who the real leader is. I think we have two things that will happen. One, a player is going to play so good. You're like, it's their team now. That might be Cameron Brink. That might be Rakea Jackson. That could be Lexi Brown, who I thought was heading towards an, uh, an all-star season before she got sick and ill midway through it. I think even earlier than that, like the first quarter of the season, she kind of got out and never really came back. She played a couple games here and there. So I think we'll see one player kind of shine, and that's the player we'll all be talking about. We're like, oh, yeah, this is their team. Or it'll stay this way, and the identity of the team will be more of a coach, kind of like college is for now. And it'll be like, this is Kurt Miller's team. He's the coach. He's the leader until they either draft another star next year or they actually acquire one, you know, kind of like some some NBA teams do where they're like, oh, they're like a scrappy, good tryhard team. And then they get their their PG, their Kawhi, their KD, and they like bring in a star. So I'm really curious to see how that works out. I think that's something to keep an eye on early on. Uh, Cameron Brink and Rakea Jackson it's really interesting right now. They kind of do everything together because they're like the two like stars. So like when they did media day, it was a lot of individuals and a couple of duos and they were the duo. Uh, the night before media day, they had a sports center hit, which was big, like a spark sports center hit before the season starts. Guess who it was? Brink Jackson. So right now they're kind of just propping those two up. It's like, again, like who's your leader? Also by marketing. It's like, these are our two stars. One was drafted second. One was drafted fourth. So 
here's our dynamic duo and like presenting them. I think as rookies, they definitely seem open to like being coachable and like also establishing themselves like, hey, we got an opportunity to run this team. I found it really interesting. Bring, I think Brink's definitely going to be a little bit of a work on progress, especially offensively. She mentioned she's struggling with the pick and roll because she didn't do as much of that in Stanford. And, and Miller loves using it in the four out, even some in the five out. He loves that pick and roll action. And he also mentioned it. He's like, yeah, she's a little rough on the pick and roll. It's like our third day of practice because they had a couple before media day. And he kind of mentioned like, yeah, she's going to work on it. And she's like, yeah, I got to work on my pick and roll, but like I'm working with them and it's, it, you know, it's going well, whatever. So that's something to, to keep an eye on early on how she does the pick and roll action with, uh, with McDonald there, who's probably going to be running points starting uh, off in the season. So I think that's one thing to really keep in mind or keep an eye on, but the, the rookies seem ready. They even kind of mentioned, I think during their sports center hit, they're like, yeah, we're trying to like, do it all and we want to make the playoffs we, we want to win a title here and Kurt Miller was kind of asked about that he's like they haven't played a WNBA game yet like you know they're excited but like <laughs> we got a long way to go before we're at title so we're a long way from there I think the team is going to play better than last year's team if they're just even relatively healthy and I do expect them to make the playoffs this year I think they'll, they'll have a good enough team it'll be a mix of a team that's kind of like a startup and you know you're not like top talent but you're excited about the future of them. And I think this might be kind of the exactly what you want the Clippers to be, where like, oh, they're they're like a team I like that's maybe not like hot, hot stuff, but like they're scrappy, they're trying hard, they're giving their full effort, and they're the goal is like, let's make the playoffs, see what position we get, and then, you know, kind of take it from there. So that's kind of my early impressions here as, as we're, we're just kind of getting started. Two homegrown players, expectations like that. Man. If only we could have that same thing happen with the Clippers, dude. It's great, though. I'm excited. Yeah, That's yeah, step by step. Yeah, yeah, step by step. So, yeah, they have – Um, I believe their next preseason game is on Wednesday. Let me look it up. I have the, the Sparks uh, regular season uh, schedule. Like, you know, I got it everywhere, but I don't have the – oh, it's Friday. Yeah, Friday against the Mercury at, at 10 p.m. I believe that's in Phoenix. Yeah, yes, at, at the Footprint uh, Center. Obviously, uh, the Suns aren't going to have to play anything there, so they got plenty of space and time there. PM? 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Right. West Coast time. Yeah, 10 p.m. Eastern. Yeah, and then and then they have their first home game. It's actually going to be like I said, they're going to be at um at Long Beach, at the Walter Pyramid. That's going to be next Wednesday. So I should be in attendance for that. I still got to work on my credential part, but it should be fine. Uh, so I'll be in attendance for that preseason game, and then they'll they'll kick off the regular season um, a couple of days after. So we're we're getting there quick. They still have some cuts to make. Uh, I think they still have – I think they have currently – they just cut somebody today. I think they have 17 left, and they have only 12 spots, so they'll have to cut off a few. So Mackenzie Forbes is one of those players on the brink. I don't know if she's going to make the team or not. I'm rooting for her too. Yeah, for sure. You know, scrappy player, California, you know, c- collegiate experience and all that stuff. So I'm definitely hoping that that she sticks around. But she's one of those fringe ones, so – We'll see how how she does the rest of training camp. And, and so far, she's, I mean, she has made the cut so far. So fingers crossed she can get in there. But yeah, excited about that. And we'll, we'll once we actually get more into um, the Spark season, especially the regular season, we'll kind of do the same thing we've done with other games. We'll recap the games. We'll recap. Uh, we'll also preview the the upcoming games and that. For now, we'll just kind of keep it, keep it here as we, um, we uh, you know, start off here and make the transition from. NBA to, to WNBA and, and just keeping up with the offseason for Lakers and Clippers. It came earlier than we wanted, but hey, some seasons are like that. There'll be some I'm sure we'll be going deep into May and June, but this one was the one where it ended a little bit early. Um, Dime, my question for you, one more Clippers-related question. Are you do you already have your season tickets booked for next year? What are you thinking about when are you are you gonna be into a dome day one? Are you you know what what's your what's your process here as as your team transitions to a, a new part of town? I'll be at into a dome day one. How I'm there, we'll we'll figure that out. But you saw what I did you see what I said at the end of my video? Not the end of it, no. I said I'm not buying season tickets next year if they run it back. You're not buying wow. No, I, I saw you mention it. I saw you mention the beginning, like you've had season tickets. It was like the first time you've had it for like you know the whole thing and all that. But wow, so does that mean run it all bad? Like, like is that is there specific players or what's yeah, what's two. the rules? For two that? of them. Yeah, two of them. Kawhi Leonard and, Paul, and James Harden. Wow. Mm, I mean, I think that I think they're I think one's back. Definitely Kawhi, right? Um. 
PG, I don't know, because he might not like. We'll, we'll see what happens there. But wow, that's 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 a statement. And Dime doesn't play around. <laughs> no, I'm being dead wow. serious. Um, especially if I can try to get credential, which we'll see. But this, I'm excited for the Sparks, man. I was gonna say, you know, I've been talking to people, people that are not really have never mentioned women's basketball to me, and people are talking about the Sparks a little bit more this year. Cam Brink and, and Rakia Jackson, like, people are talking, man. Yeah. And, like, they have a chance. As I said before, they have a chance to become stars in this city, dude. The yeah, sure. the looks thing is a real thing. Like, guys have been coming up to me and saying, man, have you seen these girls on the Sparks? Like, <laughs> this, I'm dead serious, though. Like, this, this is just how it is. So, like, it's it's uh, it's definitely going to help if they can start hooping, man. I'm just it, The buzz is going to be here. So, I'm super excited. As I said, homegrown players. And they seem like they have a good head on their shoulders. So sure. big time, baby. I'm ready. No, yeah, I'm excited. I, I have noticed they're even it, the whole WNBA is going through a, a peak of interest. I think people have realized finally, like, hey, this is interesting. It's a good product. I think the obviously the women's college basketball and then leading into here, it's like, okay, they're coming in here and stuff. So and for mo- like I said, most people, when I'm like, when you give it a shot, like it's, it's pretty good sport. So I, I'm excited for that. Of course, the growth's good. And yeah, I think this season's gonna be really interesting. You got Caitlin Clark coming in, Rakia Jackson, Cameron Brink. You know, you got uh, Cardoso who just got hurt. Reese, Angel Reese is in Chicago. So like, there's a lot of really good stuff happening. Uh, we have the the team in the base coming up soon. Uh, you know, they're, they're I believe a year away from actually launching, or two, one or two. And um, there's a few more expansion teams that are you know trying to make some noise. There, there's a few more areas they want to kind of hit up. You know, there, there's going to be interesting seeing how it's going to grow and it's definitely going to grow some more so yeah it's been exciting so all right um i think we'll wrap it up there next week we'll see what's going on obviously more with the sparks we'll see if there's any news on the laker front in terms of coaching any news for the clippers on you know pg if there's any news about Ty Lue, if we get some kind of new extension or anything like that but we'll kind of just kind of keep it to like weekly updates for now and and stick to the spark stuff and if dime wants to do some uh, NBA playoff recaps. We can definitely do that. So we'll work that out. But uh, that's the end today for episode 28 of Basketball on Figaro. Once again, I'm Menon Garcia. That was Dar-E-N Vaziri, a.k.a. Dime Dropper. Yeah.